How you going, John? Nice to have you here, man. Thanks, man. Yeah, I, you are Gauthier, the musical force, and Wally DeBacher, the musician. I mean, I, I'm going to introduce myself uh, as Gauthier, the musical force. Uh, well, no, but I, ju- I just want to get the, I, I got to get the lexicon here. So, uh, when you came in and we were chatting, I was calling you Wally. But what what do you prefer to be called? Uh, well, you know, my friends call me Wally. So. Um, yeah, I've, I guess I've gotten used to being called Gautier more often now. <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't really mind. One way you don't mind I, either. Yeah. Or short forms, goat, <laughs> wall. Yeah, <laughs> preferably not goiter though. <laughs> right, right. That's all right, I got you. Um, that song we heard off the top, Eyes Wide Open, uh, the first Australian single from this record, it's a song that you say describes your feelings of being completely defeated, I, I'm quoting you, by the realities of living in contemporary Australia. What, what's been difficult about life? there oh it's not specifically about living in contemporary australia it's about um it comes from a place of defeatism i guess in the sense of um being someone who uh kind of is concerned maybe maybe a a bit more aware than some people in terms of you know uh how things i do in my regular life in terms of use of materials driving cars you know using so much technology to make music sort of how that is so implicitly involved in so much um usage maybe over usage of um resources your carbon and, footprint um, yeah and so, so and so, sort of feeling very conflicted about that but also feeling like in sort of my attempts to research it further and and sort of make changes to that that um that it's so very hard to kind of find a clear basis upon which to make informed judgment and actually feel like you make a difference even in your own life which you know regardless of whether that's an example to other people or you know you're trying to spread the word about something you know a more environmental message you know for other people to live their lives by just purely even uh sometimes a feeling of struggle or defeatism yeah in changing things that i do but completely defeated would suggest that you you you're you, you're quite pessimistic about our future, are you? I have moments like that. Yeah, I kind of I vacillate a lot. You know, I feel I'm I'm kind of I'm I think I'm an idealist a lot of the time, but uh, often prone to bouts of um, very depressive cycles of thought and pessimism, um, uh, in sort of cynicism about the potential for for really fundamental change in the way that uh, humans live on on the earth, at least. Um, well, that's so that's affir- kind of an it's, affirmative it's, start to the interview. Yeah. <laughs> In any way, it's it's those moments anyway, and they're not sort of. Uh, it's not attempting. To, I don't know. The song sort of. Um it's not how I always feel, I guess. But it's yeah. moments when I feel like that that really prompted the lyrics. And, and, and what about the fact that you're inevitably traveling more around the world and mm. experiencing different, um, not just different countries, but different cultures uh, and different experiences in, in terms of the way we're trying to deal with uh, our issues, including the environment and ecological uh, uh, changes? Are you? Does that? Uh, make you feel more defeated or, or, or do you see things you're inspired by in, the, in those travels? Uh, I, you know, uh, touring for a music career does involve seeing a lot of airports, hotel rooms, um, cars, buses, etc. So I'm probably, I'm probably more in touch with the reality of, yeah, having an ever-increasing carbon footprint at least right. uh, in terms of sort of what, what I'm doing in my music career and it is something I think about um, so you wrote the song feeling completely defeated. You're, it's getting worse now because the song's <laughs> popular and your carbon footprint is screwing oh, I do think everybody. about that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like people, it's funny. I have more and more people uh, telling me, you know, I must be so overjoyed and amazed by the success and the bigness, how big everything's getting. But, you know, um, I guess one of the things I think fundamental to um, at least the, even, say, any concerns that might prompt a song like this to be written is the sense that um, the bigger things get, um, the less likely they really are, ever are to be sustainable or to be, you know, personal... Um, I don't know. And, and not just uh, environmentally, but materially, yeah, emotionally, per- emotionally, all of that, yeah, right? you know, trying to communicate with seemingly, you know, I- increasing numbers of people. I've kind of, I feel a bit of consternation with that. Like, um, as for, I, I, find, I, feel, I think I have a different approach even say to my Twitter, uh, Twitter, excuse me, start again, my Twitter account, uh, even though it's not like I have a huge number of people following me there, it's only sort of 40, 50,000 or something. I know there's people who have millions of people following them on these, these social mm. media, but even there, when I realize my audience is now much broader and, and I can tell that there's lots of different types of people getting into my music, it kind of does change my, my awareness of who it is that I might be speaking to mm. through these kind of portals. So. Let me come back to the implications of, of becoming as successful as you, had, you have, and it, and it is a big success you're experiencing in the last few months. Let me talk a bit about the, the record uh, making mirrors, you're, you're getting a lot of attention for this record, and, and that's got to be rewarding given the amount of work that you put into it. You play most of the instruments on it, uh, but even more remarkable is the method I'm reading of, of of taking acoustic instruments, sampling them note by note, and then turning them into virtual instruments. I mean, first of all, for people listening across the continent wondering what that means, uh, uh, and to a certain, certain extent, including me, what what do, what exactly does that mean you're doing in terms of creating these sounds? 
Uh, in the case of one instrument, like say um, an auto harp that I found at a, an antique shop, um, you know, an auto harp is not particularly, you know, new sounding instrument. It's one you've probably heard. Um, it's, it, I suppose it's just usually approached in a certain fashion in the way that you you interface with it in the way that you usually play it. So hence the way it ends up sounding on a record is usually quite strummy, quite ring, angelic, you know, because that's that's really the way you can play it. But um, to sample it note by note and then have control over those notes either by, uh, you know, triggering them back off drum pads or triggering from a, a keyboard um, or even a more non-traditional mode of sort of, you know, um, MIDI interface just means you approach those, those timbres from that instrument really differently. And so it kind of becomes like another instrument by, uh, You're creating sounds that don't exist otherwise. I don't know. It's kind of it's just like it's mutations, I guess. Right, mutations. And and why? I mean, that's in, remarkably creative and and innovative. But why are you so meticulous about that? I mean, uh, um, do you, do you have a an allergy towards just a, a strumming an acoustic guitar and singing a song, or what? Where does that come from? The desire to want to explore new sounds like that. Well, I'm really excited by records that are you know sort of feel like they open up windows to sound worlds I haven't. I haven't been in before. Uh, and so that's, you know, they're the kind of records I want to create. I'm not against using traditional instruments. There's plenty of piano and, you know, and regular drum kits and things on the record. But um, I really do. I mean, I, I don't know if I'd say it's perverse, but I have a, I have a pretty intense uh, interest in things like, you know, what if you could use, uh, you know, a can of peas falling onto a plastic ball and use that as a snare drum instead of just getting a snare drum out and putting a mic on it. It's just more interesting. It just means um, there's more of a story. I guess there's, there's a far greater range of, um, of textures well, I, I love that you're this guy and um, you're achieving this massive success. I mean, that's the most fun part of this because um, uh, there's a lot of people I admire who do that, who, who approach sound in this kind of meticulous way, but 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 they're playing the smaller niche cult crowd. So th this is part of the excitement around what's happened w with you. Does 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 it affect? It's got to affect the songwriting. I mean, if you you, you don't, I'm I'm thinking you don't take a traditional approach to to writing a song and sit down with an acoustic guitar and bang out three chords. Yeah, well, I don't play guitar, um, and so that's that's kind of a good so, thing in some regard. Uh, I do write on the piano sometimes, but you're right. Um, most of my songs seem to uh, they grow out of playing with sound. So uh, I'm, I seem to be very reactive to um, finding breaks from old records, even just textures. You know, it could be the reverb trail on the end of a, a trumpet note from a record. So it's very much an incidental. It's almost like it's the afterthought of sound, but that can sometimes catch me and, and sort of suggest a texture or a, a sound world that will prompt a lyric or a melody to come about. This, this, uh, increasingly, a lot of musicians getting a lot of attention for who, who have that same gusto or predilection for ex exploration. I'm thinking of Bonnie Bear, for example, who was mm. here not too long ago. Um, where did where did you learn that that was okay? <laughs> uh, no one's ever told me that it's not okay, I guess. Um, it's been implied to me that it's not okay when, for instance, even in Australia, um, people wouldn't consider playing my records on commercial radio stations, not because I was using strange instruments, but even though I thought I was creating pop music, they thought it wasn't pop music, which was fine. Um, no, I mean, um, probably from even when I got into a band like the KLF at age 10, mm -hmm. rather than say Rick Astley at the same time, right. uh, I was into people making pop music that well, I guess was finding large audiences that, you know, found an interesting balance between commerce and art and that was very playful with sound and it kind of to me you know kind of it it excited it opened up a part of my brain in a way that um hearing all the same synthesizer sounds all the sort of prefabricated stock patches that you might hear on big pop hits of today they fulfill a certain function you know which is you know they sound great they're really easy to produce mm -hmm. um they can be compressed and they can sound really fat and they can kind of you know sound squeaky clean when they come out of your radio and they, they fulfill the role of making a backing track for a pop voice much more easily, but um, but they're not interesting. You know, you hear them come back again and again. It's funny to me when I'm, because, you know, if you've spent years kind of playing with sounds when you go, oh, it's that preset. He's just gone to that preset on that keyboard and he's using it for <laughs> and that. And yet you're not afraid of pop music. I mean, it's a no. pop record. No, no, you're, you're not I mean, Laurie love... Anderson. You're not, you're not Philip Glass. You're not, mm. you're, not, you're not aspiring to do, to make a, a new kind of music that's more esoteric or, or, or absolutely out there. This is, oh, this is. I, well, I think I am, but, um, I still, I don't know, especially on this record, I think there was an attempt to kind of be more concise and to f try and strike some balance between that sound experimentation. Because I do love artists, you know, like Philip Glass, Laurie Anderson. I love artists, I guess, like Kate Bush, who I think do manage to find that balance where they create a sound world very uniquely their own. And it's quite idiosyncratic a lot of the time. Uh, and, I mean, especially records like The Dreaming or Hounds of Love. Some people like thought someone like Kate Bush was crazy spending yeah. five years making records like that. But to me, you know, they're some of the, the most brilliant pop records ever recorded. So, Well, I, I'm... 
I'm with you on that, and I'm, you're also a brother because your first instrument you ever learned to play was the drums. So yeah. I'm with you on this too. But but this album, this is your third. This marks the first time you've played live drums on, on one of your records. Why why was that something you stayed away from as a drummer? Uh, well, I was playing a lot of live drums in my other band, a rock and roll band called The Basics. So we were doing, you know, we were recording more traditionally with the three of us on guitar, bass, drums, and voice, just arranging in rehearsal studios or on the road uh, songs we'd write more traditionally, you might say, sitting in a room or playing together in a jam. Um, so it wasn't like I was kind of, um, you know, making Gorchia records. It wasn't, I was maybe starved of playing drums on records. Often it was just a more pragmatic approach because if, if it was a drum loop or the sound of certain drum grabs that I was programming uh, to create the backdrop against which the song was then written, there was no particular reason for me to then go in and, you know, go through the very challenging task of miking up a drum kit and getting an interesting sound of it. It's probably one of the most difficult instruments to record and uh, the sound of the drums so often really defines the space of a pop track. Right, and there's right. so many drum sounds you can produce, you know, that are like, I reckon maybe more so than almost any other instrument except maybe the guitar, they, they give you very quickly those hallmarks of maybe say which production period you might be referencing right. or whether this record right. sounds old right. or really new, whether right. it sounds dance or rock. And so usually... Um, yeah, I kind of avoid that whole conundrum, uh, which involves, you know, challenging yourself whether you're a good enough engineer to make your drums sound good, whether then if you make them sound half decent, they actually sound even interesting or they mm. just sound like, you know, any other rock band out there recording a drum kit. If you find a great break of something and can manipulate it or put it through an effect in a computer and program it and you have this great drum loop, yeah, I have no sort of preoccupation being a live drummer to go, I must play live this part. I'm quite happy with the sound result that I can get just by tinkering. So. Listening to you, it's clear you're a a smart guy and you put a lot of thought in a um, cerebral way into into the the sounds into the, the 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 record you want to make does that take away or do you worry that that takes away at all from the visceral or cathartic nature of songwriting and putting emotion out there uh no that's why i think it takes so long is because uh there's plenty of sound play that i engage in you know for days or months that never turn into songs that end up as unfinished instrumentals or just total sketch pads on my hard drive or on a tape machine somewhere. Um, but it's only really when those, uh, those sound experiments connect with something that I feel very personally connected to emotionally, I guess. Um, it's, it's usually from an emotional place that lyrics start. So that's when, I don't know, I get, you get this juxtaposition of kind of maybe, as you say, a cerebral kind of thing of going, well, what to me are peculiar sounds and what haven't I heard before? Uh, but then also, you know, um, this is becoming a song because I really feel what I'm writing about here and mm. I want to sort of express this truthfully and honestly or I really want to explore this concept because it, even whether, even if it's very whimsical and quite peculiar and, and maybe only an interest that I might share with a few people, not very pop, um, I, you know, it's when that marriage happens, when those kind of sound worlds collide with, um, you know, something I really feel about that I want to write words about, that you get Gorchia songs happening. I want to play a bit of uh, something that I used to know for, in case there's anybody out there who hasn't heard this song. Uh, um, and this has been a big part of your recent success around the world. Uh, it's a song that reflects back on past relationships. You've talked about it being a composite, not about one person necessarily. But where did this song start for you? Uh, well, it started with the first break of guitar that you'll hear at the top of a track. So uh, I pinched two notes from a Brazilian guitarist recording from 1967. Uh, his name's Luis Bonfa, uh, now sadly deceased. And he had a song called Seville that uh, starts with this um, descending nylon string guitar progression. And I, for some reason, I don't, still don't really know why, I found the first two notes only of that little mm quite innocuous intro to his song to be really hypnotic when I looped them back and forth. And so, yeah, with that little guitar loop of just two notes, um, I was quite instantly put in this kind of reflective, kind of melancholy headspace and uh, previous relationships and different memories and specific things that were said kind of came back and started prompting the lyrics. And, uh, you know, that's very reflective of how a lot of my songwriting works. It's a little bit of music prompts a certain feeling and then, you know, a song happens. I understand that song took a really long time to complete. What, what was the challenge in getting that just right? Uh, the main time delay was finding the right female vocalist to really make the middle part in the song special. So um, it didn't take all that long to write. Um, it was kind of two periods. I sort of did the first half of the song in, you know, sort of over a couple of sessions in a week or so. But I hit a bit of a brick wall once I'd written the end of the first chorus and didn't really know where to go with it. And it took me a couple of weeks to finally decide that it needed another perspective. So I, I wrote, you know, I wrote a female part for it. Um, and then it was probably about six months until, you know, Kimber nailed her vocals on it and, and we finished the mix. So it was a long waiting period. You didn't write it for her. You, you... I did, yeah, yeah. Oh, you did write yeah, it for well, her. Yeah, well, I didn't write it for Kimber specifically. No, right. I kind of wrote it... Um, 
with, oh, you know, I had some sense of what I wanted from it. So I demoed a vocal myself kind of going, well, this is kind of the, you know, the, the vocal range I imagine it covering and the right. kind of emotional arc I think it'll have. But I didn't have a specific female voice in mind. Um, it was, it was odd. I didn't have a specific female voice in mind, but I also did kind of know what I wanted from it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, and I did try with some other vocalists who were, were good, but it wasn't sounding amazing. And at one stage, actually I had somebody who I thought really would be amazing on the track who was all set to do a vocal session and she canceled on me the day before she was set to do it. And that's when I thought, you know, that was the final straw. I thought I had to let the song go. I thought, wow, I've been sort of waiting for four months. It's just not coming together. But you're not afraid of waiting you, 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 no. you're patient you really want to get it right mm. sometimes you're, it's not even just about getting it right it's just waiting for that spark to happen and sort of so sometimes like I say you know I can I can spend a long time well, what's the difference between the spark and getting it right uh, well for instance taking two years to make a record is not because I was working on that record every day for two years refining 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 it's right. because sometimes for two three months I played with sounds and song ideas that are nowhere near the album that are unfinished instrumentals, barely even begun ideas. They might be conceptually quite interesting to have explored for days, even weeks, right. but they ended up being dead ends, you know, and I decided they weren't right for my album or they weren't, or they were just, you know, a little, a little journey that I took, which kind of was fun and interesting and taught me something. But, and you know, then something sparks and a song happens that you think, you know, is really strong. And then getting that right is then the refining process, but really strong. This is a, uh, this song is a, a hit, but is, is, I mean, it's a big pop song. The video alone has more than 65 million hits now on YouTube. Have you, have you gotten a sense of wh why this song is resonating for people in such, in such a way? Uh, some of it seems to be almost self-created. Like the energy around the song has been created by the people who've heard it, like from right when it was released. Um, people shared the video you know it was um it seems to have shareability <laughs> it has a high shareability value or something but um i think people um people seem to respond to what's a fairly direct sort of raw i think um mm. rendering lyrically and also the vocals of mine and kimber's um most people say uh you know they think the video clip really enhances the, de the delivery of a song so a lot of people really have you know responded to the video and, and wanted to share it with other people um yeah so um just the pure aspect, I think, of having a kind of he, sh he said, she said, or, you know, uh, confusing enough two-person perspective on a relationship, I think, is, is an attractive thing for people because I think it, it usually reflects people's truth when a relationship breaks up is no one really knows, you know, uh, especially if you're a third party, sort of, you know, what happened between right. them or, you know, right. it's a great one story person says something, one person says something else, but who do you believe? So, the, 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 Back to this, what we started talking about in the, at the beginning of the interview, the, this, this massive success. I mean, most musicians dream of having a, a song this big, you know, or a career, quite frankly, but also having a song this big. Do you, But now that you're here, uh, and not to raid on your parade, but do, do you have any worries about, becoming identified with that song rather than uh, your body of work uh on some level it becomes your smells like teen spirit yeah you know? well that's perhaps inevitable i mean i guess everybody you know has to have their biggest song for some people maybe it's not very big at all but it probably might still be you know resonate with people more than something else on their record or over the course of their whole career so i'm not worried about that i don't sort of feel any internal pressure to go oh maybe this is the pinnacle maybe no one's ever going to respond as strongly <laughs> as to this song ever again um, if that was the case I, I wouldn't sort of mind so much because um most of my favorite songs that i've ever produced the ones that i think i don't know are the in whatever peculiar way are the, the best confluence of you know the experimentation I like, I don't know, a lyrical concept I'm really into and maybe, you know, maybe having made a production that I think is really great, that I'm really, I guess, the most proud of. Um, they're often the songs that divide people the most. They're the ones that people go, I don't get this at all. Like, what's he thinking? And I'm like, yeah, this is great. <laughs> and, you know, people who really get it, they love it. And it's kind of for those people I would continue to make music and for myself rather than the people who go, oh, somebody that I used to know is his biggest thing. Yeah, he never matched that. I'm like, they're, they're the cursory <laughs> listeners, you know? Right. I mean, but that's... I mean, that sounds kind of, you know, dismissive, but um, I'm not saying everybody has to like all the other stuff I do, right, but right. I, I'm not kind of, um, I'm not concerned if, you know, this is my biggest hit or whatever. You, but it's an, it's interesting. There's an irony here because you, you, you're an independent guy. I, I mean, that word gets thrown around a lot now, Indy, but you really are. You don't, you come from an indie place and the, mm. in the, there's that story of your first EP and, and you actually, I was 50 copies or something and you were col coloring each cover uh, of, 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 of the disc uh, or the, uh, the jacket. And, mm. and I, I love that. Do do you have a chance in how quickly and accelerated this has all happened now, especially internationally over the last twelve months, uh, to 
reflect on this and enjoy it? Or do you kind of have a chuckle to, uh, about w- how far you've come? I don't think necessarily so far back to that. I mean, perhaps maybe I feel a tinge of regret when I sense that um, when things get to a certain scale, when when things get sort of maybe maybe too big, um, it's really hard to keep it personal. And it's not hard to stay yourself or stay true, you know, stay, keep your integrity. Um, but it becomes a bit unreal. I think there's a scale beyond which where you can't really truly communicate with a large number of people. You can do it in a very broad kind of way. And it doesn't mean um, that making pop music, you can't have lots of people listen to it and get it or, you know, really get into it and respond. And that's not a positive thing. But um, yeah, it kind of feels more disconnected to me than when, say, I was hand making, you know, I was making tracks in my bedroom, hand making 20 CDs and 20 people were hearing it. And even if only five of those people were like, wow, this stuff's fantastic. Um, that's almost as satisfying as if there's 65 million views on YouTube. Or, you and know, yet you're here and this interview would lead to more people going and buying your record. Yeah. I don't know. Not that I, there's I, anything wrong no, with that. No, I, th- I, I feel, I, I, sometimes I feel a bit like a curious bystander with everything that's happening, kind of going, right, you know, I'm genuinely interested to see what happens, you know, when you have a YouTube viral <laughs> hit and when you start working with you know, major labels in territories you've never released records before and what, what that's like. It's, I'm just kind of... You're a social like, sciences major. You're, maybe, yeah. You're, you're checking it. Yeah, I'm wandering through the landscape, ex- taking notes. It's, it's an experiment. Uh, the, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about, you know, this Canadian band, Walk Off the Earth, went viral with their video performance of your song in which the five members perform while all playing one guitar. What was your reaction to that? Uh, well, I saw it when it had about 127 views. Actually, specifically, I remember it very exactly. It had 127 views on YouTube when somebody first sent it to me. And I thought it was great. And I was like, wow, it's a very, very clever idea. Very funny. It's, they managed to strike a nice balance between um, it being really quite humorous, uh, but also uh, still being very faithful to the song. Like the, the humor somehow doesn't really undercut maybe the potency of like the emotional part of the song. So You don't mind people covering your songs and doing uh, what they will with them. That's uh, You're generous, generous about that. You don't, I don't, you don't, you don't, I don't mind a, that. It's proprietary sense of uh, what have you done to my song? <laughs> no, <You're> no. Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, they did a very faithful version. I mean, theirs is certainly more flattering True. than some people's covers <laughs> and remixes. Some remixes are hilarious. Like, they just, uh, you really wonder. Some dudes, like, uh, just write me going, hey, you know, I did a remix of your song. <laughs> Check it out. And it's just like my master track with, with a kick drum put underneath it. It's like, wow, <laughs> thanks so much. <laughs> right. right. Well, that's also a remix. <laughs> um, uh, before I let you go, and we play more uh, music from your, your record. In, in the bio on your website, well, you, you you kind of shake your head at the idea that having found success in Australia, you were then supposed to conquer the world. Um, going into making this record, what were your ambitions? I did have the ambition to see my music released around the world because I was yeah I was disappointed when my last album, Like Your Own Blood, after after a year of trying, um, I couldn't find say a label to release it, you know, quote unquote, officially in North America or. Um, uh, other parts of Asia. So I managed to eventually do a very small release in Europe and Japan and that felt good. But um, yeah, I was just keen to see it released um, because you know, a lot of people sort of saying, oh, you know, it'd be great if you actually can get it available here. So I'm not having to sort of import it for, you know, $20 postage direct right, from Australia right. on CD or, I mean, now that things are more digital, I guess, those barriers are greatly broken down. And I feel in future, like, um, I mean, it ties back to what we were talking about at the start about carbon footprints and, you know, yeah. trying to live sustainably. I, I feel in future, I'd be very keen to move towards if I'm going to put out records, just doing them digitally and maybe having very limited special vinyl runs because I still think vinyl is a really beautiful product and yeah. I think it's the greatest physical medium on which, uh, you know, you can listen to music and, and kind of own it, I guess, or sort of feel a connection to the artwork and right. hold it in your hands. And so, yeah, I think CDs are, are on the way out. And although it's a kind of nice convenience for people who still love buying and listening to CDs to make it available to those people in that format, I think that's probably the biggest wastage of resources in the music industry mm. in terms of continuing to manufacture physical products. So I don't know, in the future, I'd see myself maybe just moving to a digital vinyl only release thing and maybe trying to maybe trying to do it in a way that goes back to being more independent at some stage, like smaller releases that are more one-off that maybe they're less pop. I don't know. It's, well, you've, you've clearly failed and, and, uh, and let yourself down because you are conquering the world. And <laughs> so it's a bit, a bit of a disaster, I'd say, for you. But, but you, you, did go, you did go on to write that, that the world-conquering idea, and I'm quoting you, was perhaps reflective of Australia's general obsession with measuring up to the rest of the West's heightened level of self-importance. Sometimes, I mean, one of, one of the things that struck me, that, that was an interesting thing to ask you about, because sometimes we, you know, we in Canada understand these kind of uh, similarities of how we see ourselves in, in mm. the context of the rest of the world in a way that Australia does too. Can you explain what you mean, mean, mean by that, measuring up to the rest of the West's heightened level of self-importance? <laughs> well, I've had a few people tell me, you know, 
You know, you've been pretty successful in Australia for a while, but now you're getting big in America. I mean, what does that feel like? I'm like, and this, you know, no disrespect to any person or company or, you know, or any, any energy that is, I guess, contributing to me finding success because I have no problem with that and that's great. But the implication is obviously that somehow it's that much better to be being popular in America than anywhere else in the world. And that's, that's just, I don't know, it's kind of just a very self-interested kind of approach of looking at things. I know the implications potentially also, but obviously the market is bigger. So you'll do better. You'll be more successful. You must enjoy that more than being a, you know, a big fish in a small pond. But um, I guess like I was saying before, um, that doesn't necessarily resonate with me more. If anything, I have more sort of self-consciousness or I can sort of see the concerns about like becoming maybe more famous, more being prompted to be more of a personality, you know, being a, a smaller fish in a bigger pond, if you will. So I guess that's what I was kind of trying to have a bit of a smirk at in the, in the mention. It also relates to, I mean, Australia has a bit of a, I think Australia has a bit of a chip on its shoulder where maybe it's, you're right. It's probably similar with Canada where it feels a bit like maybe, you know, you haven't cracked the Holy Grail if you haven't been big in sure, the UK or yeah, in America. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I don't really see that. I think, you know, it's, I think it's great to be, you know, you know sort of find success on whatever level you choose to kind of, however you choose to define it. And if that's just in your own country, then I think that's fine. If it's more local, it's, yeah. So I don't know. Uh, that was a great explanation. And, and, and it, it totally is something we can resonate, we can understand here. I mean, some of our biggest bands that we love in this country, a band called the Tragically Hip, for example, yeah. uh, you're, you're familiar with them. Yeah. And, well, and uh, they, some, they seemingly... still get asked almost in every uh, interview, you know, how, what, what happened in America? How come you haven't had yeah. success? You know, it's not good enough that for two decades exactly. they've been our f favorite rock band in Canada, yeah. right? And there seems to be a parallel with Australia as well, because a lot of Canadian bands, it's funny, I mean, I grew up listening to the Tea Party so much. I loved that band. And I just assumed they were one of the biggest bands in the world. And then sort of, I guess, realized after a while, it's funny now, because uh, uh, Jeff Martin now lives in Australia. And um, I've sort of, I've got a vibe. I haven't met him personally, but I've got a vibe even sort of hearing things um, just mentioned, like at songwriting summits, he might be part of it. Like, I think he sort of felt like, yeah, we were kind of set up to really crack America, but that didn't happen or something. And that was somehow a failure. But it's funny because I grew up as a teenager going tea party, just like the biggest <laughs> thing in the world. But I guess they just had a huge audience in Australia. No, I love Canada. that. I, we, we sort of go, oh yeah, the tea party. We know that. Yeah. We're down the street. Yeah. That's, I mean, uh, they were a fantastic band. So yeah. Uh, what a pleasure it is getting to talk to you, man. I, I've heard so much about how uh, smart a guy you are and, and, and how generous you are in interviews and, and, and you sure lived up to it. Thank you for this and congratulations on all your, your success. Thanks, Jen. Nice to chat.